No, you're not muted. Okay. Uh, Hello. Um, welcome to the webinar. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, just so you know that everyone is, you're not on mute any longer. So you might want to put yourself on mute if you've got a lot of background noise going on. Um, so welcome to the webinar this, this afternoon. Um, we're excited that many of you could join us. Here um, at the Health Department, um, there's myself, I'm Kaylin Fillion. Kimberly Enor is here as well as Nicole Stone. Um, Maritza is in the room and um, Elizabeth from, um, who's going to be helping us with um, some case management stuff. And we also have um, Tanya Charette who is the, she's from the EPIC program. And anyway, if you want to, you can go. I could tell you the acronym, but it's too long. It's what it stands for. So anyway, we'll, she's from the EPIC program. And she'll be sharing some information with us in a little bit. So today we're going to talk about um, a couple of things. Let's see. We're mainly here to, to give you an update so that, so that you know what's going on with um, um, plans that we're going to start in July for uncontrolled hypertension and how we're going to manage uncontrolled hypertension and um, things that we're going to ask you to do as well. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about professional, professional development opportunities that you can access and then the plan itself for hypertension. And then there's a small update on health coaching. And then um, Nicole is going to give us uh, an update on the database and the changes that you will experience beginning July 1. Okay, so um, first of all, we want, we want to bring your attention to there are a lot of professional development resources that you can attend via webinar. Um, the first, the hypertension control, um, chooseyourhealth.utah.gov webinars are actually, they offer CME credits and they're offered through the EPIC program. There's really great webinar, hypertension control, and they have ongoing webinars on diabetes as well. So they're really super great resources that you can access and um, get CU credits for. Um, yes, go ahead. Yeah, um, nurses can get one and a half credit hours, and they're free. You do have to do a pre and post test and pass with 80%, but you know, that's easy. Yeah, you guys are smart people. Like, yeah. Yeah, the other resource that are things that we've done in the program, so the webinars that are listed for the cancer control program, that website, are medication adherence, addressing tobacco use, and motivational interviewing. So you may still access those from our website and still watch those. If you haven't watched the medication adherence or the addressing tobacco use, we ask that you please do so before um, June 30th so that we can report to CDC that that was actually completed. So we want to, um, today we're going to talk about the plan that we have in place for, that we've created for hypertension control. A lot of this is stuff that you are currently doing, but we wanted to um, bring it like kind of full circle so everyone knows exactly what's expected and then what we're kind of, what you'll be doing at a local level and then what we'll be doing here from the state to kind of complement and support women as they um, do activities to help control their hypertension. So we're going to talk about accurate blood pressure measurement. We're going to talk about medication adherence, some blood pressure monitoring, that home blood pressure monitoring. Um, we're going to talk about the referral for medical, medical workup and then lifestyle modification. So I'm going to turn the time over to Tanya for a few minutes and she's going to talk about, um, she's going to talk about accurate blood pressure measurement. Hello. Thank you, Kaylin, and everybody else for having me today. This is, um, you know, when I was talking to Kayleen and she told me about the exciting, the exciting work that's going on and that you guys get to do, you know, uh, one of the things that um, is very important for uh, blood pressure control is the accurate blood pressure measurement. Um, it's something that is fairly easy to take, but there are some things that we need to do in order for it to be accurate and to be able, able to have the right readings and then provide the right uh, treatment uh, on medication for, for the patients or clients. Um, one of the things, you know, that sometimes we have seen in many places, even, you know, when I go to my own doctor, you know, a lot of the times uh, 
the, the clients come in uh, running, you know, the busy people, everybody's busy, right? But they don't have enough time to rest before they take their measurement. So if they don't rest for about five minutes, the blood pressure reading, the error goes up by 12. You know, in uh, by systolic blood pressure, the numbers go up by 12 millimeters of mercury by by six of the diastolic blood pressure. So that's a, a pretty good difference. You know, and some of these numbers might look small, but if we add them all up, that's a big change in a number. Uh, if the back is not supported against the chair, the numbers go up by six and eight. You know, if the legs are crossed and non-flat on the floor, you know, it also goes up by six on the systolic blood pressure and four milli millimeters in um, the stolic. And the, the cup size is very, very important because it also plays, as you can see in the slide, it plays a big role on, on the accurate blood pressure. Uh, if the bladder is not centered over the artery, if the cuff is not at mid-sternal level, all those affect the reading of blood pressure. And the next one, patient or staff talking. You know, I've had it happen to me, you know, that they're talking to me. And we, we understand, you know, that MAs, nurses, or whoever's working with the clients or patients, they are pressed for time. There's so many patients that, that they have to be seen and, and checked. But so a lot of people ask questions during that. I think I've only been to one clinic where they've only, they've done everything pretty much. They don't talk to me. In other places, I have to say, please don't talk to me. <laughs> talk to me after. And they look at me kind of weird. But just the talking goes up seven, uh, 10 to 17 millimeters of mercury in the systolic blood pressure and 6 to 13 in diastolic blood pressure. And then if we're using a, a manual, uh, Pump and it deflates too rapidly also affects the um, error. I mean, it increases the error in the in the measurement. So you know, if we see that the first error, is, there's the dog. This information comes from Dr. Stoltz at the University of Utah, and he is a proponent of blood pressure, accurate blood pressure measurement. He's really gun ho. That's his like specialty, and he actually advocates to having if the first reading doesn't look normal, then wait a minute and do two more and then take the average of the last two so you can get a more accurate reading and that's going to help us to do to have better um, treatment for, for clients. And then Thanks Tanya. So um, as you can see like most of the errors that are commonly made in blood pressure measurement they are actually they actually falsely elevate um, the blood pressure reading blood, blood pressure reading. So blood pressure measurement errors are really common. There was a study that was done um, that was published in the hypertension um, publication in 2010 that says you know on average you know blood pressure techniques they um, increased ele they elevated the error by 10 to 5 milligrams of mercury. Well. Five systolic, <laughs> five, ten is uh, diastolic, and um, oh gosh, okay. Anyway, you get it. The ten is the systolic elevation, and the five milligrams of mercury on the slide is for the the um, diastolic. So, um, just kind of a quick reminder: with when we're talking about hypertension control as a plan, we want to make sure that we're actually collecting the accurate measurement, so that um, we have confidence when we send a client. For referral, and we do medical workup with them, that the the values are actually elevated. So that's kind of something we really want to make sure is happening on a regular basis. So um, let's see. This is okay. So this is the plan, and I know you guys just love algorithms. Maritz always makes me do an algorithm so we can figure it out. Um, but I'm going to go through and talk about every part of this that I wanted to give you, and we'll send this PowerPoint to you so you have a copy of the algorithm for quick reference. But I wanted to make sure that we go and talk about it piece by piece. So what we're going to do with clients who have a systolic of greater than 140 or a diastolic of greater than 90, they're all going to get the same thing. So regardless of how high it is, anything above 140 for systolic or um, 90 for systolic. So um, for medication adherence, we're um, 
this is a conversation, and this is actually something we talked about in the September training, and um, things that are in the the um, policies and procedures manual. So we need to assess the barriers to medication to adherence, which is something you can do in the database. Um, then there's to teach the importance of medication medication adherence, and then link clients to low-cost medication resources. And these are things and resources that we have provided for you. If you need them, um, if you please let us know. We can resend them to you. And then um, there's a lot of different resources. I don't know if, Kim, you want to talk about the resources that they can gain access to. Sure. There are several things that um, we have provided. Um, that we will, some of this will be new that will be coming out um, in the next few weeks. The first one is a medication adherence tip sheet um, that we've developed in conjunction with Love um, to help give tips on how they can adhere to their prescription that their healthcare provider has given. Also on the back side of that tip sheet are tips to save money on your medications because we understand that that can be a barrier. Um, the next one is the pill box that um, you all have received, hopefully. Um, and these, I just want to emphasize that this is a, a tool to help those who have hypertension. Um, so this, we really um, ordered a smaller quantity to help those clients with hypertension who need medication. Um, we also have developed a tracker. It has two portions, a medication portion and a blood pressure tracker section that we'll get to later. Um, and th this has a two separate medication trackers, one that will stay with their blood, blood pressure measurements and then one that can be torn out and taken to their health care provider or put on the refrigerator to help them remember along with this lovely magnet that they can get to put on to hold up their uh, medication tracker. So these are just a few tools to help with medication adherence um, and to help overcome some of the barriers that you might encounter. Okay, thanks. So um, we are encouraging you and asking that you please um, we're going to do some home blood pressure monitoring measurements. And so we have the, there's the tracker that you'll get. Um, with, they should be print, we'll have them in hand here on, on June 30th, and then we'll send them out to you ASAP um, so that you have them on hand. And there's also, Kimberly's put together a resource of smartphone apps that clients can use for those who have smartphones and would like to track their blood pressure using that mechanism. So we'll be sending that out to you. Um, there are, we're asking that you please educate clients on blood pressure tracking and then teach them how to collect accurate blood pressure measurement. Um, we need the clients to be able to, you know, they need to understand the link between tracking their blood pressure and then taking it to their primary care provider and then to help them create a plan that will um, help them monitor their own blood pressure at home. So we recognize that some people don't, won't have access to a home blood pressure monitor. And so we've created, um, we've had an intern here who has helped us create a list of um, locations that you can refer women to in your community where they can actually go and get their blood pressure taken for free. So if you run a crowd, once we send out, we'll be sending that list out to you as well. Once you see the list or if there are things that you, that are missing, if you would let us know then we can add it to the list. So um, anyway, OK. So here's where we get into just um, the examples of the paper tracking for those who don't want to use a smartphone app or don't, don't have access to that. This is the blood pressure tracking section of the tracker. Um, also, along with the magnet, as a visual reminder that they need to be taking their blood pressure. And then this is um, the document that I'll be sending out later with the blood pressure app. Um, and this is a sample. This is just from southeast area of what the 
list looks like where they can clients can go to get their blood pressure taken for free. <laughs> so we wanted to talk about um, there was a presentation that Maritza had attended and shared this information with me. And um, I thought it was a really powerful way to kind of describe like the difference between you know what how we do what we do makes a difference with blood pressure. And so talking about weight reduction, helping people to modify their weight or reduce their sodium by using the DASH diet, adding physical activity and moderating alcohol, alcohol consumption, the, these can actually affect um, and prevent, manage and prevent hypertension. And so I think that's something um, uh, useful to kind of talk about and to mention. So there's lots of, in addition with that, other things that um, clients can do lifestyle-wise to help reduce their blood pressure. And a lot of you know this already. Um, but to discuss the sodium reduction um, and DASH diets, which we have tip sheets in the booklet to help discuss those, um, along with providing the blood pressure tracker, which you will be receiving, um, and to educate the client on the value of the lifestyle changes. So in the previous slide, Kaylin mentioned weight reduction can reduce blood pressure up to 20 points. So that's very significant. Um, and a client um, can find some internal motivation just knowing some of that. And then to help them create an individualized plan and then to provide health coaching. So I want to emphasize we have the paper as well as the electronic. So whichever um, format fits better for your clients. If you need additional tip sheets that you feel like would be helpful, please don't hesitate to let us know that. Um, this sheet helps, is, we gave this to you at the September training, but I'll send it out again with the PowerPoint as well. Um, but this is kind of a cheat sheet that if you're looking at a certain area, um, the tools and tip sheets that we have available to our clients to help assist them in those particular areas. Okay. So there was well, I've had a couple of questions about um, recording, you know, the policy regarding incentives and the database. And I just want to remind everyone that the that the teaching tools that what what are more commonly known as incentives are really actually teaching tools. And we really want to encourage you to only give items to people who are actually going to work on the goal area. Um, and the reason we do this is because we really want to tailor the um, information to the client. And so that's why you, you cannot, like, the um, tools are actually related to a goal. And so if, you, if the client doesn't make a goal in that area, the database will not collect, and we don't intend to make it so that you can store that information in the goal area. One example of this is, you know, if a client wants to make a medication, they don't want to make a medication adherence goal, but they want the, the, um, the pill box. Well, the pill box, if, if they're not going to make a, so, a goal to even use the pill box, why are we given the pill box? And I kind of want to open this up to, to you. We can have a discussion about it. So, if we could talk about, you know, why give teaching tool support like a resistance band or a cookbook or a pillbox to a client who isn't interested in setting a goal that's related to that tool. I want to turn the time over. We'll talk about it for a few minutes and then we'll move on. Does anyone have any comments they would like to share? Okay. I'm not hearing any comments. Is anyone out there? I'm 
let me do a voice check. It, will someone say anyway something hello or whatever so we know if it's working or not? Hello. Okay, so it is working. <laughs> it's so silent. I'm like maybe I'm maybe you can't talk. Okay, thank you. So if you have if you object to this, I or I we really need to hear from you. Um, but the intent of it is to really support their goals, and so uh, we're not intending to change that mechan that that restriction. Kaylin, this is Holly and Bear River. Will there will there still be the other category then? Or there is. is. Okay. Yes, we're having kind of a little bit of a bug right now with the other section because sometimes it's not storing it there. So, but we'll we're going to get that corrected. So that will be corrected. Okay. Are there other questions or concerns about it? So we can only provide a pill box to um, support their medication adherence for blood pressure, but what if they need it for cholesterol or diabetes or something? That's fine. I mean, it just there just needs to be some sort of, you need to make a goal with them. I mean, even if it's to use the pill box to track to remind them to take their medication. There needs to be some sort of goal set. Okay. In that goal area. It's not for hypertension, we'll have to do it in other. Okay, so yeah, so if it's not for hypertension, you will have to do it in other. And it won't for hypertension. Yeah, we just did medication errors for hypertension. Okay. Yeah. But, but again, it's a, a wonderful opportunity to teach why they are not adhering the medication for hypertension. Yes. Did, did everyone hear that? No. So Maritza said that it's a wonderful opportunity for you to talk to your clients about medication adherence as a whole. And we did we did it medication adherence for hypertension because that's the requirement that CDC gave us. And so it is kind of restricted to hypertension. But yeah, you'll just have to store it in other Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. Okay. So, so Lori's bringing up a good point: is that the pillbox? I mean, you all receive them; they are big enough for them to use all their medications, use it for all their medications. So obviously if you give someone a pill box, they're going to be using it hopefully for other medications that they're taking as well. So yeah, so we just need a goal in there. So okay. Are there other questions before we move on? Okay. So the medical refer medical workup or the referral for um, hypertension is how we're going to work with um, the referral is going to be a little bit different. So before we had like alerts and there was high abnormal for blood pressure and then there was a three abnormals. And so the three abnormals are going to go away, but um, we think that you're really going to like the process because it'll simplify and it really will capture, so capture those women who have the three abnormals as well. So what we're going to do for clients with a systolic of greater than 140, between 140 and 149, or a diastolic of between 90 and 99, we're going to ask that you please refer them to their primary care provider. Then they need to be issued a non-funded referral just so the client is informed, and then assist the client in making a follow-up office, office visit with their primary care provider if they'd like. And then if the client doesn't have a PCP, then link them to one in your community in your in the community. And each of you, I know a couple of years ago you worked with Maritza to create lists of um, primary care providers in your community. And I believe Maritza, you, Maritza still has those lists. Uh, yeah. And um, so if, if you need access to that, if you we just can send, we yeah. can send it out. Um, and then really just knowing that with this population, women who have their blood pressure readings between these values, the focus of it is really lifestyle modification. We want to get them to make changes and to, um, to change their, um, their blood pressure in that way. So for clients who have blood pressure above that, so if they have a systolic of greater than 150, um, 
And you can see if it's between 150 and 179 for systolic, or between 100 and 110 for diastolic, or if there are alert values, we're going to ask that you, um, the system will automatically generate a referral. And Nicole's going to show kind of like the process of what's going to happen, and you'll see it. But we're asking that you either schedule an appointment with the follow-up with a, a provider that we contract with, or send them to their own provider if they don't want to use our provider. But really, if they go outside kind of our network, it turns into a non-funded referral. And so regardless of what their value, whether, whether they go to a funded or a non-funded referral, asking that you please make them a, an appointment. Because if their blood pressure is at this level, they really are super uncontrolled, and we want to get their blood pressure controlled. So um, we ask that you please document the information in the, in the referral and then um, set up the time and the, and the, in the database so that we know who they're going to and that we can follow up with them. So what's going to happen once you collect that information and store it in the database, then we're going to, from here, send the client a reminder to, um, to track their blood pressure. We're going to call them to remind them to track their blood pressure, and then we're going to remind them to go to their blood to go to their appointment, and then um, to take their blood pressure readings with them, and then we're going to follow up with them to make sure that the client goes. So it's really important for us. It's really important that you collect the provider information to help us simplify like the volume that we're going to have to go through to get the client to to comply and to remind them to track their blood pressure so, um, and to go to their appointment. So what, how the referral has changed is that um, this is the next, the anyway, chart. I guess this chart right here kind of really describes what's going to happen. So if they've got an alert, you'll always refer them. And then if they've got uh, uncontrolled hypertension, you'll um, refer them and they'll get case management. The population that are not going to get referred and they're not going to have case management are that are clients with a systolic of 140 to 149 or a diastolic of 90, between 90 and 99. And those we're really going to focus with lifestyle modifications. The change to the referral is that there, the three abnormals is going to go away. So you won't see that in the database really. Um, you won't see it. Um, we do have options, so if you have a special case, um, you may, you know, contact Maritza and yeah. they may be able to work something well, out. And case by case. Yeah, it's like a case by case, but as a general rule, this is like the referral process that will follow. Does anyone have any questions about the new referral process? Aileen, can you just back up to a slide? This one? Okay. Yeah. Occasionally, I, I deal with most of the alert values. Well, I have seen patients that they have seen their provider a week ago, and I read your notes that say provide, uh, uh, still an alert value, but she's under the care of a provider. Still, I would like you ladies, please make an appointment because what I have found out when I touch bases with the provider, they either A, have not seen the provider for several months and they said that they just saw them. Second, the provider is not even their provider. They were seen by something else unrelated to their hypertension. And there is the third option that they indeed are seen by the provider. So just having said that, I really would like, in case, always make an appointment with the provider. And um, if that is the case that they have seen the provider a week ago, I can deal directly with the provider and cancel the appointment. I'm talking about the alert value. Yeah. Because we've had a lot, Marissa's filled with a lot where the client just say they've been, they've been and I, they really haven't. And I don't know how they get their medications refilled, <laughs> but the fact that they have alert values, it tells me that they haven't even refilled their medication. Yeah. So they are not just taking it plainly. Yeah. 
Do you guys have any questions about the the referral and the to the provider? Okay. Okay, just as a quick reminder, the reimbursement hasn't changed. It's still the same. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about all this or do you want me to talk about it? Okay, so it's not anything different. You'll be reimbursed $70 for a client when, you, when they first come to the door for doing risk reduction counseling and to help you recall them to the lifestyle, um, to the health coaching. And then each lifestyle session will reimburse your organization $42 for a session, the individual session, and then $72 for a group session. Um, the combination, just as a reminder, when a, when a class and an individual session happens on the same day, you get reimbursed for the class. And you have to at least have two wise woman clients present. Otherwise, it's just, a, it's just an individual session. So um, just a reminder about that. Um, let's see. And then the methods of delivery are the same things that we've talked about in the past. Um, face to face, face to face group, individual. You can you can use the phone with an individual, or you can do a mail with follow up. Mail with follow up is something that um, the client, like you wouldn't do any life health coaching with them if it's a mail with follow up. It would just be a matter of did you get it? Did you open it? Did you like it? That kind of stuff. And so if you do health coaching, then it becomes an individual session um, over the phone. If that if that's how you end up following up with them. Um, and that's kind of repeat. Um, okay, so this is just a reminder that um, it doesn't matter where they fall um, with their blood pressure. Blood pressure still counts as one risk factor. So even though we split it out earlier um, as far as what will happen, as far as health coaching, that does not change. So they'll still be counted as one risk factor for health coaching. Also, the classes, um, this is kind of an update. The classes have been removed from the session count in the database, and only individual sessions will be counted. So for example, if Margaret has a blood pressure of 142 over 96, and all of her other values are normal, she has one risk factor. She'll get a health coaching session the day she comes into the clinic, two months later, and then six months, at six months, despite if she comes to a class or not. So if she comes to a class on month two, she will still get a lifestyle session also in month two. Do you have questions about that or comments, concerns? So just as a reminder, we will reimburse you for the classes, but it just comes out of like the recommended or the the um, number of sessions that you provide each client. Just to ensure that clients are getting the same dosage across the board. Okay, and then um, Nicole's going to talk about it more in detail. But there is like it, when we go over the database, there is. On the last session, so at month six, um, what will happen is the clients will, um, that final assessment that CDC added to our requirements this year will show up. And it'll show up like once you completed that second session. So this Mar the, using the example for Margaret, she gets three sessions. After she has that second session, it's not how it's going to work. OK, I'm just going to shut up because I'm like giving you bad information. So. Are we there yet? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to turn the time over to Nicole. And she's going to walk you through what the database is going to do. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I know you're not fine. Okay. Okay. How do I get to the database? Okay. Put this guy down. Okay. We'll just. I'll get to the final assessment. We'll just go through the database. Um, updates. And you probably have noticed a couple of them have been um, implemented in the current version. Um, so I'll kind of review how, how they're supposed to be working. And then a couple of you alerted us to some problems with the way that final assessment was 
working. So in the version that's going to be implemented just prior to or around July 1st, um, hopefully all those issues have been, will be, have been worked out. Um, so I wanted to show you the first thing. Um, let's go to plant. So the, I don't think anyone's mentioned, but I think you, you knew that this was happening, that um, if a woman is a smoker, that that is now calculated in to the count of required sessions as a risk factor. So if you see this client here, she is a current smoker. And her clinical values show that she has one, two, three risk factors in addition to being a smoker. So what should happen, let's keep our fingers crossed, is that um, she should have four required sessions. So, so that just ups that a little bit. Um, and we thought that was an important one. And CDC has mentioned to that several times, why are we not including smoking as a risk factor? And we agreed. So you'll now see that that has changed. Um, so let's see, what's the next thing? Um, the final assessment here. Um, so the reason, again, why we took out the group sessions was to allow you to do as many classes as you want without it, um, having an impact on when that final assessment is due. As we thought we had it all worked out before, but as we found out, the final assessment is, is really required after you've completed all of the sessions. But if they come to a lot of classes and are really excited about the program, that final assessment was showing up within, you know, way too soon. And so we did a couple things to fix that. We took final assessment out of it being tied to a session, so it has its own tab here. And then um, I'll just, if you can be patient with me real quick, I will um, show you how that final assessment will show up. So you have um, a new session. Let's see if it's going to take, oh, it's not, it's actually pretty fast. So um, we'll go, we'll say, say maybe, You know this process, everybody. Um, make sure you're entering all this data for MDEs. And then, um, so this is an individual, it's a face-to-face. -face, um, let's see if we can, ah. I cannot, I, I sympathize with you, all of you on the laptop. Okay, so we saved that one. So then it ticks down to, no, so um, the person still needs three sessions. So we'll go new session, so we'll go face-to-face. -face. Um, this person is going to have a, um, a class instead of an individual session. Um, and it happened in um, April. So that all should be fine. You have to have your coach in there and save it. And Oh, what did I forget? Topic. All classes are an hour. Okay, and so now you see it's still saying that you need three sessions. So you can, the individual, um, it only ticks down if you have an individual session, but again, like Kayvin said, you'll, you'll definitely be in re reimbursed for that. Oh, it shouldn't allow it to be on the same day. Um, so then, I'm gonna make sure that's correct. Okay, so then we have a new session, and I'll hurry and click through this real quick. Um, we'll go 15 minute. Um, we'll go, talked about exercise. Um, and as you know, I'm speeding through this, but you all know that every time in between you should be setting goals and saving your goals and reviewing the goals, but we're not going over that today. But that is all something that is part of this whole process. Um, so then, and this one's going to be in May, and it's an individual. So now we just need two more. Um, she comes back in, and you know, again, this is all for fun. These are all supposed to be spread out too, over nine, six to nine months. Um, this one is face to face, and it's going to be 
a 30 so if minute. You take, if you take their blood pressure at a, life, a lifestyle session, you can also record it there as well. Yes. So she comes in on this visit and, and she actually comes into the office and you see her and you're supporting your blood pressure um, control. You can come in here and you're like, you can, she's been record, she's been taking it at home, so you can record it here on this session, and you should. And we'll look at that data, and CDC, you know, has asked that we report that data if you actually collect it. We have a place to put it in here, and they, they do um, look at that. And then, so we have one session left. So she comes in, oops, this isn't going to let me do that. You know, only one session per day, so we'll change this one to, um, uh, And then new session. So this is the last, so it's her last required session. She, you get a hold of her on the telephone, um, do all the work with her, and um, talk about a lot of things. And then, and it's going, and it's an individual. Um, so then you're all done with her. So you click save, and that's one that will show up. So it will show up when you've completed that last one. It tells you you need to do it here. It's zero sessions. So I'm hoping that solves the problem. We wanted it to show up when you were done with that last one, but not before, so that you wouldn't forget. And then also not have the person leave or you hang up the phone, and then a week later you look at it and you're like, oh, I should have done that session. So it, it will show up right when you save it. You can see that there. And then you would just go to, OK, so now it's time to do the final assessment. Um, uh, something we put into place here was that if the um, initial assessment during that conversation she said she didn't have any of these conditions, no, blood, no high blood pressure, no problems with blood sugar or anything, she already answered no to all those questions, it will pre-populate the assessment so you don't have to ask those questions again. And so you can see that we we had already filled out this assessment and there was no issues with those first few questions. But we do want to know about changes in behavior no matter what. So we'll always ask you to ask about their, um, their diet and about their mental health and about their smoking because they're possible, I guess, that if they weren't a smoker, they become a smoker. But we do want all those questions to be asked. But you won't have to ask anything that is clearly not applicable in the final assessment. And then you just save that. So that's kind of how that works. And I hope that answers the questions. And I hope that will work out for everybody. Um, I'll show you real quick. Um, I would love to be able to go through the whole process with someone that had um, high blood pressure or the, the new values um, to show you that it, how the automatic referral works. But as you know, every time we do something with the database, there's going to be a little issue that has to be worked out. And they are correcting a problem. But how the new, how it will look to you is, um, well, let's go back real quick to, so um, on measurements here, um, if the client has a, a blood pressure over 150 here or over 90, um, or 100, it's 100. Over 100, 100. yeah. Sorry. So I'm sorry. So if the average blood pressure is systolic 150, 150 or greater or um, 100 on diastolic or greater, um, what will happen is that a referral will be created automatically, um, and it will show up here um, as you're used to with the alerts. It's the same thing, um, but it's not completely all the issues aren't worked out, so it's not completely working. So I'm just going to create one to show you what it will look like. And so um, let's see here. Um, you'll see that the value has changed here for blood pressure. Um, We've added an alert value for an A1C over 10. So any woman that has an A1C greater than or equal to 10 will now be needing a referral for Maritza to, to follow up with. Um, anything else on the automatic result that you can think of that I should cover? I don't think so. OK. So these values have stayed the same, the cholesterol and the blood glucose. Um, the difference is, you, as Kaylin said, there's no longer that um, referral for the three abnormals. We're not making that available. However, this, um, these values that you see here will be um, available in case you have um, 
an issue that you would like to um, have Maritza follow up with the client on, if there's something of concern, we gave this um, option. We're still working out logistics on that, whether or not we want to have you go ahead and populate it, or if you know if you just want, if it's a phone call to Maritza and she can do it. And, um, but those will all be worked out by you know July when the time comes, and and whether or not so this, this these values may be disabled for you, and you can call Maritza or you know let her know of the situation, or they may be available and we can run a report for for us to see them. But, needing a follow-up. Um, I think that's all on the referral process on the screen for for the new referrals. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, yes. Yeah. So that, um, making the, and I, I'm a little nervous about trying to print it, but you know, as always, this is the place that you would enter the information for the physician that you're referring to, correct? And or if it's a facility that that um, you're referring them to, um, we are. Th this is just a test database. This is these are not real data, and um, these lists are being cleaned up as we speak, so that um, it'll, it'll be more applicable. You can refer to any facility um, that we've contracted with, or if the if the client has a physician or a facility that she's. Um, you know, really wanting to go to, you can do that too, and you just populate it. That hasn't changed, but that information is very important. And when you complete these data, um, you know, we print out a referral, and it's all populated, and that's what you can use to send with the client and to make the appointment. Yes. Yeah, it's very important because I need to follow up with those providers. Yes. Please. And when and if you can have a phone number, it's yes. great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's super important, what the, you know, to fill out as much of this information as you possibly can. And the appointment date and the appointment time. The, the appointment date is actually what we use to calculate the days between the time the client was seen and the time her of her appointment. And that's an, it's a required piece of data from CDC. And and. Um, again, for the alert that has to be within seven days. And so that is a very important field, just so you know why we do that. Um, okay. I wanted to show you another quick um, change that um, should not have too much of an effect. But um, as you know, um, this client that we're looking at, she indicated that she was a smoker and that um, she is well, we're going to say she is interested in quitting, and she wants a referral to our quit line. So um, what should happen here is we see an automatic referral for, for the tobacco quit line. And um, nothing's really changed with that. You go in and you ask the client, um, so you said you wanted to you know, quit smoking, and, and we've got this quit line. And you explain about the quit line a little bit to her give her some information about what goes on there, and you indicate yes here, and that is the equivalent of her signing the, the paper form that we used to use. So that's a really important, um, in fact, the system doesn't let you bypass that. If, you, if she wants a referral, you have to click yes on there. Then you have the option of saying a few other things, can, you know, okay to text or when the best time to call is. And then it does require that you put down whoever is the, the person kind of associated with that referral. I don't know that they ever really contact that person, but they do require some contact person for who made the referral. And then um, what's different about this is that we, uh, the tobacco quit line um, is being run by a new vendor. So our tobacco program has contracted with this new, um, it's a Lair company or something. But anyway, they have a new logo, so it looks a little different. And um, the information where if you were to mail it has changed, but the fax number is the same. So the, um, really there's not, it, it should be seamless for you. You just fax it to the same number you always have, but because it's a new vendor, the referral looks different. That's about it. And so that will happen not until July 1st. This, this company is not contracted until then. 
and for just to make sure. Mm -hmm. The program is called Way Too Quick because mm -hmm. the packing still saves you the quick lunch. I think, you, I think it's, I it's think, okay. uh, yeah. so, so Utah Tobacco Quit Line, that, I believe, if I'm not, it's a national, like that, I mean, the Quit Line is a national, okay. so, um, but the vendor who's, um, who's in charge of uh, facilitating the services is this way to quit, and from what I'm told, um, they're, I mean, they got the bid because they're, they do more with the client, and, and, and we're hoping to see even better results. And so we'll be talking about that probably. We'll be doing some training on, um, actually, I think the quit line has offered some training later on that you can see. Um, like, they'll talk to us about how often they try to contact the client, you know, what their success rate is and, I mean, their, their um, processes and kind of what all is involved in what goes on with that quit line. So that's coming down the road. But um, the tobacco program is really excited about this new vendor, so I think it's a good thing. And I think that's all the data collection changes. Um, and I'm, oh, you know what? It, it's not. I wanted to say I did get some emails and with some questions about some issues. And um, OK, let's go back really fast. And I'll, and I'll be quick. Do I have time? Yeah, OK. So um, let's, uh, I'm so scared to go out of this. If I close this, what's going to happen? <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, there is the question about women that come in and they have no risk factors. And so, as you know, we require, we still require them to have at least one health coaching um, session. But, of course, we're not asking you to re-ask the questions that same day. So I guess it, I haven't figured out or I need to work with our contractor on how to disable that final assessment if there's no risk factors. But just so you know, and I think it, you, know, you probably knew that, um, don't worry about doing that final assessment when, when it's the same day. That you don't need to do those questions. And, and CDC understands that they're not requiring us to submit that data either. Um, what is the, another question real quick? Oh, um, those final assessment questions, let's look at those really fast. Um, the question came up about what questions do these include? And our answer initially was that these are, this final assessment um, requirement, as you all know, um, just all of a sudden showed up from CDC because they, it wasn't something that they initially had in our grant and we weren't counting on doing it and we didn't have it in our data collection system to begin with. And so we had to find a way to get it in and we you know, worked out a few issues. But um, so you know, the questions that we're asking, they are specifically um, MDEs, or minimum data elements. They're required by CDC. Um, the question on sodium, which is the 1,500 milligrams of salt, um, we excluded that from this final assessment because, again, at the final hour before um, you know, everything was good to go for starting to screen, CDC decided that um, that question was too complicated or they didn't, you know, they had too much backlash, I think, from people on understanding that question. So they actually removed it from their requirements. We kept it in the data collection system, and I still think it's important. We're kind of looking at um, some data quality issues. We're wanting to validate maybe that question with the two additional questions that we're asking about sodium. So that's why we're still having you ask it. but. Um, but honestly, it actually has been taken out as a required data element, so it will not show up in the final assessment. Um, same thing with, I think there's a couple of, we, we ask a question about meat and, and water. Those are questions that we think are important and, and good to look at as far as behavior change. And we actually look at those very closely when we do our analysis at the end for behavior change. But they aren't um, CDC required questions, so they're not going to show up on this final assessment. Um, but, so you know, too, though, CDC does appreciate any additional data that we collect, and they're interested in seeing the, any responses that we have about the sodium and um, about meat and about the water. So don't bypass them just because I'm saying they're not CDC required. They are still really important, and we do look at that. I think that's all the questions that I can address at this time on the call. I know there's just 
still some issues that I've got some emails about that we'll be working through, and I'll get back to you on both. I think that's it. Okay, thanks, Nicole. Does anyone have any questions or concerns or before we end the call? Oh, this is Monica from Bear River. I still haven't um, been able to log into that new system, um, and we have clinic on Thursday. Will okay. I be able to log in under someone else, or how will that work? We will get that ironed out for you. It's Joanna. Okay. Monica, um, I'll, I'll work with Joanna. On, she's not here this afternoon, but I will talk to her first thing in the morning and make sure she's, she has worked so hard to get everybody up and running, and, and I don't know that she was aware that you, you still weren't able to, so I promise I, I did. I did actually speak with her yesterday, and she was going to pass my number on, on to somebody. Okay. Um, okay. I won't be here tomorrow, and then I'll be back on Thursday, but we have clinic first thing on in the Thursday. morning. So. Okay, okay. Well, we'll I'll definitely um, find out what the status is of whatever she's working on for you, and I'll send an email so that you can okay. have it before you start your clinic and, and so that we know okay. what's going That'd be awesome. Thank All you. Right. Thank you for letting us know. Uh huh. Are there any other questions or concerns? Okay. So we have a couple of resources that we will be sending out to you. So watch. We'll send them through the BC Cancer Lister. So we'll send the PowerPoint and then some other resources as well um, to help kind of um, process through kind of the few of the changes. So if you if you do have questions, please feel free to call. You can call me or you can call Kimberly. If you have questions about the database and the data collection, um, Nicole is probably your best resource. Um, she really knows the data in and out. And we appreciate that about her. So um, anyway, um, we'll just I guess we'll close now. Do you have an extra one? We'll we'll send out a reminder for the next quarterly call. Um, and then we'll look forward to hearing from you. If you have questions, just please give us a call. Thanks, you guys. Have a great day. Thank you so much.